Well, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 10, shall we? Luke chapter 10. Uh, last time we were together, as we finished up Luke chapter 9, it was a very lengthy chapter, 62 verses. And we looked at a great many things regarding the 12 disciples. Uh, most of all, what we saw, it, the, these guys were lacking. They, I mean, they lacked in knowledge, they lacked in understanding, uh, they lacked in humility. They lacked in unity. They lacked in love. Listen, these guys were messed up. But Jesus would choose to use these guys to turn the world right side up, we would say. And that blesses me to no end. Because if God can use a bunch of knuckleheads like these 12 disciples, there's hope for all of us. Amen? Well, this brings us to chapter 10 of Luke's gospel where our focus now changes we switch from looking at the 12 disciples to the 70 disciples. The 70, you say, oh yes. Look at verse 1. In Luke 10, 1, it says, After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. So yeah, our attention switches from the 12 to the 70. Now, there is a difference. The 12, of course, have a very unique and special ministry in that they were with Jesus day and night for three and one half years, if you will. But the 70, on the other hand, they are more picturesque or pointing to the church, we might say, the body of Christ. So as we, looked at, so as we look at things about the 70 disciples, it really paints a picture for us as the church or uh, those who are believers, we might say. So with that, let's pick up our reading in verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 16 in our study together today. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, sack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you. And heal the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in, the day, in that day for Sodom than for the, that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented a great while ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be thrust down to Hades. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Now, in these first 16 verses, as we've already mentioned, we're going to be looking at the 70 disciples, picturing you and I, the body of Christ, the church as a whole. And if you're taking notes or outlining our study today, we're going to look at three things. Three things in light of the 70 disciples. Number one, the first thing we learn about the disciples is they were appointed. They were appointed. Look at verse one again. It says, after these things, after dealing with the 12 disciples from chapter 9, the Lord appointed 70 other disciples, we would say, also. So, the appointing of the 70 disciples. Kind of interesting, this word appointed that's used here in verse 1. It's only used twice in the entire New Testament. Once here and once over in Acts chapter 1. 
after the death of Judas in Acts chapter 1, the disciples got together, the 11, and they were going to pick the 12th apostle to replace Judas. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 24, they prayed that the Lord would show them which of the two would replace Judas and the ministry. And of course, the lot fell to Matthias. Now, in Acts 1, 24, they prayed to the Lord which one the Lord would show them. The word show is the word appointed. Now, just as a side note, there are those who say, well, Matthias really shouldn't have been the 12th apostle because they picked him before Acts chapter 2, before the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And on the surface, that might sound reasonable and, and rational. However, in Acts chapter 2, after the day of Pentecost, in verse 14, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, under the power of the Holy Spirit, said Peter, in, in second. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, he said, Peter stood up with the 11. Now, I'm no mathematician, but 11 plus 1 makes 12, yeah. So, it would seem that Matthias is the correct pick, just as a side note. Now, the word appointed carries the idea to be called, to be chosen, to be elected, to be appointed. It also carries the idea of lifting someone up to a place of prominence or a place of visibility as an exhibit for others to see. So this becomes an important aspect of being appointed, especially as it pertains to the 70. Because God raised up this 70 to a place on high, we might say, that they would be an exhibit or on display for all to see. And family, what is true for the 70 is equally true for us. Because all of us are called. In fact, Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 6, that we are the called of Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, we are the elect of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, you and I have been chosen in Him. So all of us are selected, appointed, chosen. Therefore, all of us are elevated to a place that everybody can see. And I guess the practical application for us is, is simple and can't be missed. And that is, as believers, as Christians, people are looking at us. People are watching us to see what we're going to do, to see how we're going to act to see how we would respond to certain, certain circumstances and situations. They're looking at us. They're watching us. <laughs> when my granddaughter was very young, I would take her to Walmart to go shopping. I said, now, Grandpa's going to buy you three toys. And we would, I, I know, I'm a big spender. <laughs> we went all the time, Okay. And, and I don't know if you know this, but Walmart has about 20 toy aisles. It's like endless. So three toys, I'd put her in the basket and she would go, go here, Grandpa. And we would go down this row and she would find a toy and put it in the basket and we'd get three toys. She goes, no, I want to put that one back. And she puts it back and we're up and we're like two hours up and down the toy aisles, okay? I mean, that's just something we did. We did it on a regular basis. It was fun. We had a good time. But on one occasion, when we finally got three toys... We get to the checkout stand, and we're standing in line getting ready to check out, and a gal from the church uh, comes up. She says, Pastor Clark. I said, hi. She said, I've been watching you. <laughs> I said, well, that's creepy. <laughs> she said, no, I've been watching you with your granddaughter. How have you been interacting? You see, gang, people watch us, whether we know it or not. People are aware of what we do and where we go, how we speak. And our lives, as those who are called, chosen, appointed, are on display for all to see those. So the question is, what kind of example are we setting for others? What kind of example are we setting for our family, our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, our relatives? You know, Second Peter 2.21 says, Christ is our example. We should follow in his footsteps. 
Back to Luke chapter 10. Let's come to the second thing we want to look at. We said there were only three. The first thing we learn about the 70 is they were appointed. Number two, the second thing we learn about them, they were sent. They were sent. Look at verse one again, if you would, please. Let's just start at the beginning. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them. He sent them two by two before his face into every city and place that he himself, Jesus, was about to go. So they were sent. Now the word sent that's used here, apostello, the word apostello used 133 times in the New Testament, it means sent. Now we get the word apostolos from that. It speaks of one who is sent or a sent out one. We can almost say that word in English. It's the word apostle, apostolos, apostle. So in a very general sense, in a broad sense, all of us are apostles because the word simply means a sent out one, a messenger, an ambassador, one that goes out and heralds a truth from others. That's what the word apostle means. Now, our apostolic ministry is not like the 12, don't misunderstand. It's like the 70 in that we were sent out. And this becomes an important thing for each and every one of us. Why? Because (laughs) all of us are sent out ones. All of us are ambassadors for Christ. All of us are messengers for the gospel. The question is, are we willing to answer the call? Are we willing to be sent out? Are we willing to be messengers? Are we willing to be ambassadors? That was a question. (laughs) Hey, this is a heavy issue. Now, being an apostle or a sent out one or a messenger doesn't always mean we have to travel halfway around the world and live in the jungle and eat bugs. You know what I'm saying? Being an ambassador for Christ could mean going to work every day and being the messenger for Jesus at our workplace or maybe just down the hallway in our own home to a family member who doesn't know Jesus, maybe to our neighbors, maybe in our community, or maybe right here at the fellowship. We're simply answering the call as a sent out one, because God sent us here to the barn. So are we answering that call? Are we willing to say, Lord, I hear you calling me and desiring to send me, and I want to go. You know, I will never, ever forget, you know, when the Bible study was in our living room, you know, almost 30 years ago, Um, It started to grow, and a lot of people were coming to our house on Friday night, and we subsequently had to move out of our house to an apartment complex here off Margarita. One of the gals at the uh, Bible study, uh, she was the manager at the apartment complex there, so she let us use that room. You know, in a lot of apartment complexes, they have like a center, central gathering area with a kitchen and a big dining room and a fireplace and a big meeting area. And so we were meeting there. And there was a few apartments that were empty. So the kids, we had children's ministry in some of the empty apartments. I, maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't know. Um, it was 30 years ago. Nobody cared. <laughs> And so, you know, the Bible study started growing. Uh, I don't know, there was probably 45, 50 people showing up on a Friday night just for Bible study. And and I'll never forget, after one of the studies, I had a group of people come up to me and they said, Clark, you know, we want to move the Bible study to a different day. And I said, okay, what day are you thinking? They said, well, Sunday. And I said, well, I don't think Sunday night's any good for the Bible study because, you know, we got to get up early Monday and I'll go to work. So Sunday night's probably out. They said, no, you misunderstand. We don't want to meet Sunday night. We want to meet Sunday morning. And I said, are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? You've gone berserk. They said, no. This is our church. We want to meet on Sunday mornings. So I talked with Pastor Chuck. I met with Pastor Chuck, and I was sharing with Chuck all that was going on. And I said, Chuck, you know, the Bible study went 
it, it just grew and grew, and now we're over here, and I don't know, there's a bunch of people coming, but, but the whole Bible study is absolutely out of their mind. They went berserk. They want to meet on Sunday morning. I mean, they need help. <laughs> they need therapy, maybe even shock therapy. I mean, these people are out of their mind. Pastor Chuck, what do I do? He laughed, you know, ho, ho, go for it. <laughs> And I said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, go for it. And I'll never forget going home. I was on the floor in our living room, and I was curled up in a ball. I was, I was in, literally, I was in physical pain, literal pain. I was agonizing over this because I did not want to do it. This was not in my plan for life, believe you me. And I'm on the floor, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doubled up, I'm in pain, I'm, I'm crying, and, and Sally, my beloved wife, sitting on the couch laughing at me. <laughs> and finally, I acquiesced. Finally, I said, okay, God, I give up. <laughs> I tapped. I said, I'll do it. And I'll never forget quoting Isaiah 6, 8. Here am I, Lord. Send me. And you know, here we are today. And it's just about us being willing to say, okay, God, I'll answer the call. I'll be your messenger. I'll be your ambassador, whether it's at work, at home, at school, at play, wherever I'm at. Lord, I am all in for you. Back to Luke chapter 10. Now, note carefully, class, in verse 1, how Jesus sent out these 70. Notice it says he sent them out two by two. This is exactly how he sent out the 12 apostles in Mark chapter 6, verse 7, two by two. Why? Well, no doubt for a couple of reasons. One, probably for support and encouragement. Uh, you, you know, I mean, it's always nice to have a support system with you when you're going out to do something. Uh, because the fact of the matter is, these guys were going to in incur a lot of opposition and a lot of persecution. In fact, in verse 3 of Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, I send you out as lambs amongst wolves. They were going to be in for some very hard times, no doubt about it. So they sent Jesus sent them out two by two so they can encourage one another, support one another, lift up and edify one another. And boy, what an important picture that paints for us. Because we're not the Lone Ranger in our Christianity. In our walk with the Lord, we need each other to, to support and encourage each other, to lift each other up. But I think there's a second reason why he sent them out two by two, and that is for accountability. So when they entered into these different cities, as we'll see in a moment, the response is going to be different. Sometimes they'll be received. Sometimes they'll be rejected. So there's an accountability partner with each other, just in case they go to one of these cities that reject them. And one of the disciples say, you know what? I think we should just call down fire from heaven and consume this entire village. And the guy with him will smack him upside his head. He said, don't you remember what happened to James and John back in Luke chapter 9, verse 54? They wanted to do the same thing. And Jesus said, you guys are out of your mind. So let's not do that. Oh, yeah, you're right. So there's an accountability aspect to that. And, and that's one reason I don't like to meet with anybody by myself. Because there is no telling what I'm going to say. And I'm going to definitely get in trouble. So it's just a good idea to have somebody with you so they can nudge you as they often do and say, Clark, did you mean to say that? And I'll say, did I say that? Yes, you did. No, I didn't mean to say that. That was absolutely incorrect. Follow me? So I, I think a second reason is for accountability. There's a third reason, and I think it's found right here in our text, and that's for preparation. At the end of verse 1, Jesus sent these two guys, two by two, to go into the cities before Jesus got there, to prepare the way for the Lord. No doubt through accommodations, no doubt for food, but also to prepare the hearts of the people. 
So when these disciples went from city to city, their, their message is, hey, you guys need to get ready because Jesus is coming soon. He's going to be in your town before you know it. So you need to get right with God. And so I think there's an aspect of preparation for that. And what was true for them is equally true for us. Because when we tell people about Jesus, one aspect of that is, you know what? There's really no time to lose. There's no time to waste because Jesus could come at any moment in time. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the Bible says Jesus Christ is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God is going to blow, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So Christ could come back for his church at any given moment in time. He could come right now. Okay, he didn't, but he could have. <laughs> he certainly could have. There's an old song we used to sing. Um, good old song. <laughs> oh, oh. Soon and very soon we're going to see the king. Soon, okay, fine. Nobody knows it. Soon and very soon we're going to see the king because Jesus is coming soon. And that's the message of preparation. You know... <laughs> Many years ago, there was a, a family here at the church, um, a young boy, he's about five or six years old, and, and you know, I like to stand at the back of the sanctuary out in the foyer and, and greet everybody as they're coming out of the sanctuary. Every Sunday, without fail, every Sunday, a little boy, his name was Jason Ciccarelli, he's now a great man of God, but uh, back then he was about five or six years old, and every Sunday he would come and stand in line and wait to, to come up and say hi to me. And when he got to me, he would stand up very straight and proud and quote his memory verse from Sunday school that day. So stinking cute. Every Sunday, he would quote that memory verse. And I, oh, Jason, that was amazing. That was so good. One Sunday, he wasn't very patient in line. He was very, you know, I could tell something was wrong. I thought maybe he had to go potty. Um, so I... I pulled him up front. I said, Jason, come on up. I said, what's going on? What, you, you look like something's wrong. He said, past the clock, past the clock. Jesus is coming back. Hurry up. Tell everybody. Because <laughs> in Sunday school, they were teaching that Jesus is coming soon. And soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. And what a great encouragement that should be for each and every one of us as well as ambassadors, as messengers for the gospel, as those who are sent out, whether it's halfway around the world or right down our hallway. Back to Luke chapter 10. Let's come to the third and final thing we want to look at regarding these 70 apostles. Number one, they were appointed. Number two, they were sent. And number three, and finally, they were instructed. They were instructed in verses 2 through 16, Jesus gives six instructions to these 70 disciples. Note them carefully, class. Number one, the first instruction involves praying. Praying. And it involves missionaries or mission endeavors, we might say. Take a look at verse 2. Verse 2. And yes, we will finish today. <laughs> In verse 2, it says, Then he, Jesus, said to them, the 70, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, hire an outside consulting firm to launch a campaign <laughs> to raise money for your missionaries. Oh, no, I'm sorry, he didn't say that. He said, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Therefore, put a thermometer on the stage that says, let's get hot for God to raise money for missions. Oh, he didn't say that either, did he? Jesus said to pray. Pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray to God that he would send out labors into his harvest. Man, 
Pray that the Lord will stir hearts. Pray that the Lord will raise up. Pray that the Lord will send out. And pray that the Lord will bring the harvest. It's all about prayer. And the idea here is pretty simple. As it pertains to missionaries and mission endeavors, we need to pray that it's a work of the Spirit, not a work of the flesh. That it's a work of the Lord, not a work of man. And I can't tell you how many churches and missionary endeavors I've heard use the first part of verse 2. That the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Therefore, we're asking you for money. I mean, it's unbelievable. All you got to do is finish reading the verse. Jesus said to pray. In other words, we should ask for help, but we need to ask God for help. I can't tell you how many letters I get every month asking for support. Like, where do you get that principle? Churches hiring consulting firms to launch a capital campaign to raise money to build a new orphanage out in the middle of nowhere. That's not what God says. God says to pray. We need to pray that the Lord does the work. That's why... You rarely hear anything about missionaries or church plants here at the fellowship. We just pray. You know, every two years, we bring all the missionaries and all the church plants back to the fellowship. We have a missions day out on the grass. And nobody's asking for money or anything. It's just informational. And we, it corresponds with the pastor's conference for Calvary Chapel. And, and we kind of kill two birds with one stone, if you will. But, you know, it's just informational. And we just pray. And, you know, God has blessed us where our foreign missionaries, they can't work because they're, they're not locals. They're not, you know, indigenous to the area. They're foreigners, so they can't work, so they need support. But we've never sent out a letter to ask for money ever in 30 years because God provides and God meets every single one of their needs. So, you know, this is a great principle. So if anybody's asking for money, I would run. I would just say, you know what? This ain't right. Jesus said to pray. Pray to God. Pray that God raises up and sends out and that God does the work. And what a beautiful example we see here for us. It's number two. Uh, The second thing involves watching. Now, this is subtle. Number two, the second instruction involves watching. Look at verse three. It says, go your way. Behold. Ah, there it is. Behold. Watch out. Be alert. Be careful. Be on guard. Why? Because I send you out as lambs among wolves. I'm sending you into the world. And the world is going to chew you up and spit you out. They're going to ravage you because they're wolves. So watch out. Be careful. Now, this is the exact same thing Jesus told the 12, by the way, in Matthew 10, chapter uh, chapter 10, verse 16. But he added one more thing. He said, but be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So as the 70, we too are to beware. We're to watch out. Because we live in the world and we're lambs, if you will. But we're to be smart. We're to be wise as serpents. You say, are serpents wise? Are serpents smart? I mean, look, you try living in the middle of the desert with no arms and no legs, okay? (laughs) I'm just saying. They got to have something going on in that little snake brain of theirs. (laughs) But we're to be harmless like doves, gentle, soft, kind. And for you and for me, this sets a beautiful picture by way of contrast. Because the world are wolves, Christians are lambs. The world says, repay evil for evil. But Romans 12, 17 says, repay no one evil for evil. The world says to hate your enemy. Matthew 5.44 says to love your enemies. 
What a contrast. And you know, anytime the world says anything, chances are we should do just the opposite. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. Well, back to Luke chapter 10. Let's come to the third thing we want to look at. <clears throat> and that involves trusting. Trusting. Look at verse 4. Jesus said, carry neither money bag, sack, nor sandal, and greet no one along the road. So if you were sent out by the Lord, put your trust in the Lord. And obviously, a lot of churches, a lot of missionaries don't understand this principle. They're looking to man to provide for them rather than the Lord to provide for them. Because if God sends us, he is going to provide for us. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall provide all your need according to his riches in glory. God's going to give us everything. You know, I, I told God when everything just started, I said, God, if there ever comes a time where I have to ask for money, I'm out. I'm gone. And you know, God has just been faithful for almost 30 years. We don't pass a plate. We don't ask for money. There's no heavy-handedness. There's no guilt trip. It's just got to be a work of the Spirit that God moves upon our hearts to do what he's called us to do. You know, I like what Pastor Chuck used to say. He said, where God guides, God provides. You know, Jesus, in, Luke, in fact, turn over to Luke 22 for a moment, just a few pages to the right, if you would, please. Luke chapter 22. Because when Jesus sent out the 12 apostles, they came back. And in Luke chapter 22, when they came back after their missionary journey, Jesus asked them a question. Look at verse 35. Drop down to verse 35 of Luke chapter 22. And he said to them, Jesus said to the 12, when I sent you out on your first missionary journey, I told you not to bring a money bag, no sacks, and no sandals. Don't bring anything with you. Did you lack anything? So they said, Nothing. We lacked nothing. They didn't have to send out letters of support. Uh, they didn't have to make phone calls asking for money. All they had to do is trust the Lord. You know, it seems like we're always back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, does it not? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your path. Back to Luke chapter 10. You say, well, Clark, I understand that, and that's a glorious uh, concept and principle for us as believers, but why, at the end of verse 4, did Jesus tell these guys to greet no one along the road? Well, that's a good question. Now, in ancient times, when you greet somebody on the road, it wasn't just a hi or a handshake. In ancient times, it was a process. Even today, by the way, uh, if you're traveling out in the Negev of Israel or in the wilderness of the area of Judea, there's a lot of Bedouin encampments. People, the Bedouins are still there to this very day. They live in tents out in the middle of the desert. And if you were to walk into a Bedouin camp, even though you're a Gentile, even though you're uh, an enemy, an infidel, and they want to kill you, they will invite you in. For three days, you'll stay with them. You'll sit down, you'll eat, you'll drink coffee, and then on the third day, you can leave. So in ancient times, it's a process. Two to three days to say hi to a stranger. And the point here, when Jesus said, don't even say hi to anybody on the road, is like, guys, there's no time to waste. There's not a moment to lose in being that messenger, that ambassador, the proclaimer of the gospel. And I think secondly, don't just greet somebody because you think you can get something from them. And we'll talk more on that in just a moment. So I guess the point here in verse four is twofold. Number one, get busy for the Lord. <laughs> and number two, put your faith or trust in the Lord. Well, let's come to a third or uh, fourth matter. Actually, we said there were six. As it pertains to these instructions, the, uh, <clears throat> the fourth instruction involves receiving. 
receiving. Look at verses 5 through 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> In verse 5 of Luke 10, it says, But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. So the first aspect of receiving involves peace. When you go to a town, someone invites you in, great, pronounce peace. Let them know that Jesus Christ is coming and he is the one that will give you ultimate peace. And if they receive that peace, great. And if they don't, that's okay too. You just be on your way. And the par parallel for us is pretty simple and straightforward. For you and I, true peace is not found in our circumstances. True peace is not a lack of turmoil in our life. True peace is not an abundance of provision for our life. True peace comes from Jesus Christ and Him alone. The question is, are you going to receive it or reject it? In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. So Jesus wants to give all of us peace. How? By accepting Him, receiving Him as Lord and Savior. That's the peace, Philippians 4, 7, that passes understanding. It guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. In fact, Jesus is not just the giver of peace. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible says that he himself is our peace. If you've got Jesus, listen gang, if you've got Jesus, you've got peace. And no matter what we're going through and dealing with, and please don't misunderstand, precious family, I'm not trying to minimize what we go through. I, I recognize that it, there's great difficulties in our lives. But we still have peace. We still have rest. We walk around with that goofy Christian grin on our face. Man, your hair is on fire. Yeah, praise God. <clears throat> is that your car they're towing? Yeah, God's good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just peace. It's rest. But verse eight, uh, verses 7 and 8, the receiving not only involves peace, it involves food. Take a look. Look at verses 7 and 8. In verse 7 it says, And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you. For the labor is worthy of his, of his wages. Don't go from house to house looking for better accommodations and better food. Verse 8. For whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. So don't feel bad about receiving food and lodging from somebody because a, a workman's worthy of his wages. And don't go looking for bigger houses and better food. Just be okay with where you're at. Eat whatever's put before you. Now, <laughs> I've traveled to a lot of different places around the world, and, they, and I've had a lot of interesting food set before me. Some of it was a little scary. <clears throat> I remember uh, down in the jungles of Central America, uh, we were deep in the jungles, and we, we, we finally got to a village and, and the chieftain, we had to meet with the chieftain of the village to get some permission to, anyway. We met with, and this was a real National Geographic moment. Believe me, they had bones in their nose and no shirts. I mean, it was like, whoa. Good thing we didn't have kids with us. So they welcome us in. We sit down and they bring out food because that's, you know, how we bond with food. And they said, I'll never forget, they set a plate of food down right in front of me, and I immediately, in, in my heart, started praying. I said, oh, dear Jesus, bless this food. <laughs> Cleanse it, wash it, purify it. <laughs> I said, Lord, just please make sure it's really dead. Because there was something moving. I, so, yeah, but I ate it. You, that Bible says, eat what's set before you. I chowed it down. You'd have been proud. I didn't fare well for the next couple of days, but the point is, the point is just be content with what God provides. Whatever house you're in, whatever food's given to you, just be content. Paul talks about that, by the way, in Philippians 4, 11, and 12. He said, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. 
Now, y'all in the state of California, you need to get over it. (laughs) And I know the grass looks greener, but back to Luke chapter 10. Let's come to the fifth thing we want to look at. We have to hurry. We only have 45 minutes left. Number five. The fifth thing involves preaching. Preaching. Look at verses 9 through 11. In verse 9, it says, Heal the sick who are there. Say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you, or preach the gospel, we might say. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go to the streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, whether people are healed or not, whether they receive the gospel or not, That's up to God. Our job, our responsibility is to tell them about the kingdom of God. Twice Jesus mentions it here. So our responsibility is to be that messenger, that ambassador, the sent out one to tell people that Jesus is real and getting to heaven involves just faith in the Lord. Now, how they respond is up to them. That's on them, not us. And I think that's the simple point here. Well, number six and finally, it involves judging. It involves judging. Uh, That's in verses 12 through 16. In Luke chapter 10, verse 12, it says, But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day, notice the word day is capitalized, for Sodom, that'd be Sodom and Gomorrah south of the Dead Sea, than for that city that, of course, rejects the gospel message. And then he goes on to say, Woe to you, Chorazim, and woe to you, Bethsaida, two cities in the northern area of the Sea of Galilee. For if the mighty works which were done in them had been done in Tyre and Sidon, two sister cities north of Israel in in modern-day Lebanon, there on the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea, they would have repented a great while ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes." But, verse 14, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, the third city there on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, who are exalted to heaven. Capernaum, of course, was exalted to heaven in the sense that Jesus uh, based his operation of ministry in Capernaum. He preached there, he healed there, he raised Jairus' dead daughter there. They saw it all, they heard it all. They were privy to all the ministry and miracles of Jesus Christ. But they will be thrust down to Hades. So back in verse 12, when it talks about that day, it's talking about the day of judgment. That these cities heard about the kingdom of God. These cities were privy to the gospel of Jesus Christ, bringing salvation, but they chose to reject it. Therefore, they will be thrust down to Hades, or hell, we might say. And this becomes an important issue, because some people think, well, God, you know... God's a loving God. He would never send anybody to hell. Well, you're right. God doesn't send anybody to hell. We send ourselves to hell. In fact, in Matthew 25, 41, the Bible says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for you and for me. But clearly, there's a choice to make. All of us have to choose. Look at verse 16. It says, he who hears you Here's me. He who rejects you, rejects me. He who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So you and I, as messengers, as ambassadors, we don't have to feel bad about people rejecting the gospel message that we bring because they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting Jesus Christ. And they subsequently are rejecting God who sent Jesus. And they're rejecting Jesus who sent us. Follow me? So we shouldn't feel bad when people don't accept eternal life. Why? Because all of us have a choice to make. You know, God loves us so much, he's made us free moral agents. We all have a free will. We can choose to receive Jesus. We can choose to reject Jesus. And by the way, please don't think that You haven't made a decision regarding Jesus yet. Please don't think that somehow you're 
in the middle of the road regarding Jesus? Or that, well, I haven't rejected him. I just haven't received him yet. I'm, I'm just kind of in between. Oh, no, you're not. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, you are either for me or you are against me. Either you gather with me or you scatter abroad. Listen, gang, there is no neutrality in Christianity. There's no middle of the road. There's no sitting on the fence. Either we are going to heaven because we've received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or we are going to hell because we reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I realize that's not a popular message in a lot of churches today, but that's the message of the Bible. And that's the message for each and every one of us. And as we bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord, as Pastor Nick comes up, the question that faces each and every one of us is, how have you responded to the kingdom of God? How have you responded to the gospel message? You know, maybe you're here today and... and it's just been going through the motions for you. You've just been kind of playing the part. Or maybe you've been involved in religion and you never really accepted a relationship. Or maybe you've just kind of walked away from God and you know it's time to get right with God. Or maybe you're just not really sure if you're going to heaven at all. Look, whatever the case is, right here, right now, you can be absolutely certain of your eternal destiny in heaven with Jesus. And all you have to do in your heart is say yes. That's all you have to do is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's what the Bible says. And if God's tugging on your heart, I just want to pray for you right where you're seated. You don't have to get up. You don't have to go anywhere. We certainly can't do anything. But if you know that you need to get right with God, I just want to pray for you right where you are. You slip up your hand real quick so I can see it. If Yes, God bless you, young man. I see your hand. God bless you. Yes. Maybe you're outside on the patio. Maybe you're in the overflow room. Maybe you're watching live on the internet or listening live on the radio. Look, wherever you're at today, if you want to be 100% sure that you're going to heaven. I, I just want to pray for you. If God's tugging on your heart to, to get right with the Lord, because Jesus is coming soon. He's coming sooner today than he was yesterday. <laughs> and tomorrow's going to be sooner than today. So you need to make sure you get right with God. And if that's your heart, I, I'd like you to pray this prayer. Just pray it in your heart. Say, Jesus... Right here, right now, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And I ask you to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And I ask you to become my Lord and my Savior. And Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters, all of those who've dedicated or even rededicated their life to you. Lord, I just pray you would bless them, fill them with your spirit, encourage them, empower them. Go before them, lead, guide, and direct them, Lord, into all truth and righteousness. For your name's sake, we pray. And we ask it in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.